Hello and welcome to Bridging the Gap Academy. Today we're going to provide you a four-part series of neurology and ophthalmology. My name is Mustafa. I'm a doctor starting ophthalmology training in Glasgow from August. I'm going to take you through this whole course. In today's part of the neurology ophthalmology series, we're going to start with anatomy. We're going to move on to seizures and go on to explain a little bit about meningitis and encephalitis. Now, before we start, what we're going to do is a three question warm up to help us get in the mood. And please pause the video after I've given you those three questions, because I'm going to go into the answers straight away to see if you can get the answers or not. Question number one, what cells are affected in Guillain-Barre syndrome? Question number two, what receptor is affected in myasthenia gravis? And question number three, is there forehead sparing in Bell's palsy or not? Now, pause the video, write down your answers, and we'll get started right after the break. Okay, guys, so the answer to number one, Schwann cells are affected in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, Schwann cells are the myelination cells of the peripheral nervous system. So as you can imagine, when Guillain-Barre happens and it affects the Schwann cells, then you're going to get a lower motor neuron attack and ascending paralysis. Number two, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune attack against the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. And number three, is the forehead spared? Well, the answer is the forehead is not spared in, in Bell's palsy. And the reason for that is it's a lower motor neuron disease. Now, forehead sparing occurs in upper motor neuron regions, such as a stroke, because of bilateral connections to the forehead. Okay, guys, so we're going to start off with a bit of anatomy. And that actually, this anatomy is really important because it comes up a lot in exams. And it's really how the brain works. It's the really most superficial bit of anatomy. So there's four typical lobes in the brain. There's the frontal lobe, there are the parietal lobes, there is the temporal lobe, and there's the occipital lobe. Now, each of these functions we discover actually by the disease of it. So let's start with the frontal lobe. It's right at the front, obviously, right here. Now, um, when affected by a stroke or when someone maybe is drunk, then you get something called disinhibition. So people start to do things that they would not usually to do. So this is characteristic of a frontal lobe lesion. But another thing that's really important, which we'll move on to in our next slide, is Broca's area. Broca's area is located in the frontal lobe and it's responsible for expressive aphasia. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the patient can understand normally because Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe is working fine, but they just can't produce coherent speech. The next thing we'll talk about is the parietal lobes. So the parietal lobes sit just up here and the parietal lobes, um, when affected, in the dominant parietal lobe, you get something called acalculia, agraphia, and finger agnosia. So this syndrome is called Gertzman syndrome. The other thing you can get with parietal lobe lesions is a visual field defect, which is a homonymous inferior quadrantinopia. Now, how do I remember this? Well, as you can see in the diagram, the parietal lobes sit above, and as you know, everything in the brain is opposite, so it's an inferior quadrantinopia. Now, if you move on to the temporal lobe, the temporal lobe produces a homonymous superior quadrantinopia because the temporal lobe sits below and it it's opposite, so, so it produces a superior quadrantinopia. Um, what else happens in temporal lobe lesions? Well, actually, most seizures tend to happen in temporal lobe lesions, and we'll go on to talk about seizures in a little while. But if someone comes in with a seizure, then you may want to think of, you know, epilepsy, but you may, may want to think of an elderly person or immunocompromised person, a secondary cause of seizure. Now, this may be encephalitis, which we'll also talk about today. It may be a brain tumor, so seizures happen in the temporal lobe. And finally, the occipital lobe is where a homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing happens. So there you have it. These are the main things you want to know about each lobe because you may get asked it in exams. The next thing we're going to talk about is the next diagram, which you'll see right in front of you. Now, you'll see important areas and important things you want to know is, first of all, you want to find a central sulcus. Now, anterior to the central sulcus is the precentral gyrus. Now, this is the primary motor area of the brain. You need to be able to identify that in the background. Now, just posterior to it is the, is the post-central gyrus. This is the primary sensory area in the brain. You also need to identify that in the diagrams. The two other areas you want to find is Broca's area, highlighted in purple here. Now, this is responsible for expressive aphasia, and you find that in the frontal lobe. And the second area you want to find out is in light green, you find Wernicke's area, which is in the temporal lobe. Now, Wernicke's area is responsible for understanding speech. So these patients, because they have a normal function in Broca's area, they can speak fluently, like you can speak on and on and on. But they actually don't understand or they'll speak rubbish to you because they don't understand what's going on because Wernicke's area is actually affected. This is what you need to know. Next thing in anatomy that we want to cover quickly, 
are the circle of Wallace. So the circle of Wallace is made up of certain vessels. And if you want to pause the video here and see if you can name them, because we'll move on to the next slide with the answers are ahead. Okay, guys, so hopefully you've managed to name them. So what you get, actually, if you follow it, you get two vertebral arteries moving on, making a basilar artery. And from the basilar artery, you get the posterior cerebral artery. Now that joins with the posterior communicating artery to join the middle cerebral artery. Now the start of that is the internal carotid, continues as the middle cerebral artery, then it moves on as the anterior, anterior cerebral artery, which are joined together by the anterior communicating artery. So there you have it. This is a circle with this. This is what you need to know. And later on, when we come to learn about, in probably part three of the series, we'll come to learn about a third nerve palsy. I'll talk to you about how the third nerve runs between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery just underneath it. And then it moves longitudinally with the posterior communicating artery. So any aneurysm in the circle of there will give you a third nerve pulse. Okay, so the next topic we're going to talk about is seizures. And because this is a rapid series and it's not meant to go into too much detail, I won't go into too much detail of seizures. If you want a proper session on seizures, then please let me know and I can create a separate video for that. So the first seizure we're going to talk about is a tonic-clonic seizure. That's the most common seizure you'll come across. And what happens is tonic means it stiffens and then you start getting jerks. So this is stiff and jerk. And really what I want to talk about is treatments. For the treatment for a tonic-clonic seizure, the first line is usually sodium valparate. Unless you're a female of childbearing age, then you want to use lamotrigine in that case because it's not teratogenic. Next thing you want to talk about is a seizure called myoclonic seizure. So myoclonic seizure is actually just jerks that happen. It could be the neck, it could be the shoulder, it could be the hands. And it usually happens in rhythmic, uncontrollable fashion. So maybe someone is making a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and they start jerking and they spill their cup of coffee. That's a classic exam question. Again, the treatment for myoclonic seizures is going to be sodium valproate. Next type of seizure I want to talk about is absence seizure. This happens in kids, and often teachers will tell the parents that this kid is suddenly just daydreaming. The child will be talking, 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 and, and then talking again for 10 seconds. They are not aware. They have absent consciousness. They don't know that this has happened. The treatment for this is ethosoxamide, if you can say it right. And the third, the fourth type of seizure is actually a focal seizure. So this is a partial seizure. It could be complex if there is impaired consciousness, or it could be simple if, if the consciousness is fully there. These seizures are usually treated with lamotrigine or carbamazepine. So this is all I'll talk about. The next topic we'll talk about is meningitis. So meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. And write, the, write down in the comments below what the meninges are, and I'll answer the question and maybe highlight it in bold. Um, also guys, if you're enjoying this series so far, please like and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this. And I'll leave a link down below for our email list. If you want to hear when these videos come out, then please just sign up. We'll add it to our mail list and we'll send it out every time we put a video. Um, so fine. The next thing I want to talk about is meningitis, as I said. So inflammation or infection of the meninges. It's usually bacterial in form. And usually the, in, the bacteria or the organisms vary depending on what age you are. So in neonates, the bacteria could be a group B strep, or it could be a listeria. In children, it's usually haemophilus influenza. In adults, it could be haemophilus influenza or strep pneumonia. So how do we figure out if meningitis is actually bacterial, viral, or TB? That's a common exam question. What you do is a lumbar puncture, and the lumbar puncture tells you all the analysis of different things. So a typical exam question would be a three-stem question, and it would ask you, is this viral, bacterial, or TB? So what do we look for? Well, we look for protein. We look for glucose and we look for what type of cell they are. So in bacterial, this is polymorphs, which means it's neutrophils. Um, they would have low, low glucose because all the bacteria has eaten up all the glucose. And this is how you remember it. And they would be high in protein because bacteria are full of protein. So this, if you get a stem with something with polymorphs, high protein, low glucose, that's bacterial meningitis. Second one I'll talk about is viral. Now viral, as we all know, is made of lymphocytes. So the cell type will be lymphocytes. They'll also be high in protein because viruses are protein and they're going to have normal glucose because the viruses don't eat up all the glucose. Next one is TB. It's a bit of a mix. TB is going to be lymphocytes, surprisingly, and it's going to be high protein because it has protein, but it's going to have low glucose because the TB is eating up all the glucose. So hopefully you find that useful because that will give you so many marks in the exam that you wouldn't usually get. Now, how do we treat it? Um, if you're in a GP practice, you want to straight away give IM benzyl penicillin because this is a diagnosis you don't want to wait for because people can die from this. Um, also, the other thing I'll mention, which is in a different video, which I'll link up here, um, is how does meningitis present? Well, it presents with a headache, a fever, and usually a rash. And a typical sign you find is a sign of meningism is basically neck stiffness. So whenever you get neck stiffness, you know that there's some sort of meningism happening. So how do you treat it? 
In the GP practice, as I said, it's IM benzyl penicillin. In the hospital, you want to give IV keftriaxone. And at risk groups, so for example, neonate, you want to add ampicillin. Or over 50s, also add ampicillin to cover for listeria. Now, you want to give also dexamethasone with or just after the first dose of antibiotic. And if you suspect a viral cause, you're going to add a cyclovir to this as well. So this is a general treatment, and hopefully that can give you most marks in the exam in this rapid neurology series. And finally, the last disease we'll cover in part one of the series is encephalitis. So encephalitis is inflammation of the brain parenchyma. It's not of the meninges, so you're going to get an absence of neck stiffness. Their neck is going to be completely fine, and that's a really important sign you find in the history and examination. Encephalitis is caused by a virus. It's usually caused by herpes simplex or varicella zoster, and it's usually in patients that might be immune compromised. So, for example, how does it present? It affects usually the temporal lobe, these viruses. So it presents with a seizure, it presents with a fever and a headache. So fever, headache, seizure is usually the presentation of encephalitis. And if there is a rash, then you might want to suspect a varicella zoster encephalitis. Now, I've seen a patient myself like this in hematology. They were immune compromised. They developed a rash and the next day they developed a seizure. Straight away, we were like, this is varicella zoster encephalitis. How do you treat it? Treat it with IV acetylene. So there you have it. I've actually given you a lot of information here. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and ring the bell. That's a lot to ask. So we'll start off with some questions just to end the series because it's been a lot of information I've given you. First of all, we'll start with the CSF analysis because that's very important. If someone has CSF analysis of lymphocytes, high protein and low glucose, what would that be? That would be TB. Now the next question. If someone is understanding you perfectly, but they can't speak to you, what's that called? Yes, that's expressive aphasia, and that's a lesion of Broca's area. Lastly, if a kid suddenly wants to talk into stare it out and comes back, what's that called? How do you treat it? It's absence seizure, and you treat it with ethosoxamide. Okay, great, this is the end of the video. Please tune in for part two of the series where we cover more diseases. Thank you.